on this episode of May TV. Passive House is a low energy building, so it uses very little energy to heat and operate. And I ended up in Prince Rupert. <laughs> And I, f I uh, finished my apprenticeship there as a plate fitter. So, so I started in 69, I think, and I finished in 1971, 72, somewhere in there. So this is one of my designs that I just came up with. So I made some kids' ones. They're hanging up over there. And people really liked this one So for adults, so I made some for adults. Tanze, and welcome to May TV from the beautiful Kimberley Alpine Resort in Eastern British Columbia. We are taking the show on the road in this episode and will be mostly featuring the Métis people from the Kootenai area. Let's meet the Regional Director, Deborah Fisher, to find out more about this beautiful place. We're in the Kootenays, we're right in front of Lake Windermere. And I'm here today with uh, Minister Deborah Fisher. You're also the regional director for this beautiful part of British Columbia. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Daniel. My first question is always, tell us a little bit about who is Deborah Fisher and how did you get involved in the public life? Well, first of all, I'd like to um, acknowledge um, the uh, traditional territory of the Tanaha people and the Sikwaknek people and the home of uh, Columbia Valley Métis, and also welcome you to our beautiful valley. Thank you. It's good to have you here. My uh, political involvement, I didn't realize I was really into politics <laughs> until I looked back and realized that I've been involved with uh, Métis politics for over 20 years as uh, a local uh, Métis citizen. Um, I'm the founding um, president for Columbia Valley Métis, and prior to that, uh, we had a shared uh, chartered community with Golden. So kind of the uh, board of directors moved from one community to the next over the years, right. so until we became our own separate uh, community. Now, uh, Minister, you were also, um, maybe not a lot of people know this about you, but you were a foster mom. So you took in a lot of kids from within this community. Tell our viewers a little bit about that. Well, my mom and dad took in foster kids. And so uh, two of my foster sisters, we remain very close um, and considered family. And so they role modeled uh, the need. My mom actually wears the child in care as well. It wouldn't have been called that in that day. She would have been, it would have been more a cultural, uh, cu cultural thing that they did with a child who needed a home. Um, that being said, my husband and I and our three children, um, we um, have taken and hosted over 35 children through our home. Wow. Um, those have been foster children, emergency care, respite care, plus uh, international travel, uh, particularly the last couple of years. We learn more from those children than they ever learn from us. And it's, um, to me, we did it because it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. We have children that are in need and as citizens, it's our duty. Now that's a really good segue for the <coughs> fact that you were appointed as the Minister of Children and Families as well as the Minister of Education. So clearly both those portfolios have real attachments to, uh, to Métis kids. Tell us what uh, maybe one of the biggest challenges is right now. We'll start first with the Ministry of Children and Families. I would say the biggest hurdle at this point is not um, legally really having a say in uh, what happens with our children. Uh, we have over 750 children in care at this time and we don't know where they are. We actually don't have um, any uh, rights to those children. The exciting thing is, is though, is our Indigenous governance um, body um, is at a at the next level and so uh, hopefully soon we will actually have a say in what's going to happen with our children. We want to bring those children home but we want to make sure that we have a really good sound safe and um, strong foundation in order to do that. And as I said uh, a moment ago you're also Minister of Education so what are some of the key areas of uh, priority areas and things that you're working on in that file? Well, the education, um, going back to children and families for just a minute, it's a very underfunded uh, ministry. Uh, we literally get $500,000 um, to support our, our children in care, which we disperse out to our um, service providers and work directly with them. 
But um, in education, we're uh, federally and uh, provincially funded for our uh, Early Years program, which is an award-winning program, actually. We won an award this year. And so we service children from zero to eight years old. Mm -hmm. We have an incredible uh, support system now. We have services available for uh, respite care or if we have a child that has specific needs that we can try and address. We really don't get funding for uh, kindergarten to grade 12. So that's the huge, the, the, the big struggle is not being able to have a right to allow our people have a say for our children, mm -hmm. um, particularly in the education system. Um, I worked in the education system for 26 years and um, I have to say, you know, I spent my whole career advocating for Indigenous people, but Métis uh, specific now in my role as it is today. It's very hard to advocate uh, when you don't have any funding and you don't have a say. And anybody who knows you, uh, who's worked with you, knows that you, you have one saying that's quite, I guess, well known, and that is to put the child in the centre of the room. What does that mean for you? That is probably my inner core drive is no matter what we do as adults, we need to put a child in the middle of all of our decisions. If it's not good enough for that child, it's not good enough for anybody. So everything that we do um, has to revolve around making sure that the support systems are in there, there's culture, there's language, um, just whatever a child needs, that's our job to, to provide. And so the decision really should be quite easy. If it's not good enough for the child, then, then why are we doing it? Why are we doing it? Minister, I want to thank you. Uh, we, were, we lucked out today. It's a very beautiful day today in front of Lake Windermere. Um, I would encourage any of our viewers who are watching the show today to come out to, to visit you. There's a, a lot of Métis people that live in this part of British Columbia, and that's an important message to get out because I think a lot of people don't realize that. So I just want to thank you for being on TV with me today. Thank you very much, Daniel, for coming. We're taking a short break, and when we come back, Lisa Shepard meets two special Kateayaks on Vancouver Island. Talk to your elders, um, find out things, learn, 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 and, um, and, and then you'll get to a point where you can share. Welcome back. On May TV, famed Métis artist Lisa Shepard focuses on our elders, called Kite Ayak, or Old Ones in Michif, the language of the Métis people. The Métis elders we meet on this show have had fascinating life journeys, and we are humbled that they share their life stories with us. Let's meet Joe and Bertha Laundry from Victoria, BC. <laughs> Bertha and Joe, thank you for meeting me here today. I'm wondering if you would be willing to share a little bit of your life experiences with us today. I think I'd like that. Yeah, yeah. I would like that too. I brought a tobacco offering Oh, for you. thank you so much. That's thank beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, what was it like growing up Métis? It was wonderful. We had ups and downs. The down parts were going to school and sort of, especially my older brothers and sisters, they were they couldn't speak English. He spoke Michif when he went, and they were bullied. <coughs> and so they got into lots of fights and, okay. and stuff like that. But as the time went by, I lost the language because, the Michif language, because mom and dad said, no more fighting, no more being bullied at school. We're only going to speak English. Oh, really? Okay. Sure. And where did you live? I was bought, I was bought up in North Balford, Saskatchewan. Okay. In a little run-down shanty town, Mickey shanty town, I guess, in the north end of town where there was no running water and stuff like that. And that area is kind of known as a Métis community, right? It was at the time, yeah, but it's no longer there. When I was first born, I was born in a road allowance community. In now, can you explain for our viewers that don't know what is road allowance? Road allowance is a, a small area areas where the when Saskatchewan or a different place not just Saskatchewan we're going to build a new village or a new town or a railroad they had little inlets of land that weren't very 
wide, 50 feet wide, and, and quite, quite, quite long. So the Métis people lost their land and they couldn't get jobs, especially in the 30s, and 20s, 30s, 40s. They were the poorest people in Canada. So they couldn't <coughs> afford rent or anything. So they moved into these little strips of land and started up a little Métis community. And Bertha, what about you? What was it like growing up Métis? Oh, well, actually, I didn't, I didn't grow up Métis. Um, oh, okay. I uh, was born into a farming community, and uh, my dad's uh, parents spoke French. Um, we had tortière at Christmas and all this French sort of traditions. Um, my mom's family were German-Irish uh, immigrants, so she didn't speak Métis at all. Um, my, my dad, like I said, did speak French, but the only thing was, <laughs> I would ask him, like, who are we? Who, who am I? Right. And he would say, you're English because your name is Pollard, which is an English name, I believe. Um, but dad, like I said, dad's family spoke French. He, he had the, har the worst French accent in his English that you could imagine. And his complexion was very, very, very dark, very dark. And so I just, nothing made sense to me. So I kept asking and uh, never did tell me. Now, whether he was told not to say what he was or he didn't know. I'm not quite positive because unfortunately I didn't find out I was Métis until I was in my 50s. I met Joe though um, when I was 15, he was 18, and uh, his family just welcomed me in. They were the most loving and so interesting, like their lifestyle, their, their culture, I, I just couldn't believe it. Just by being part of that family, um, I just felt Métis. So, Joe, tell me what drives you to do this work with children, to educate children about our culture? What drives me is uh, the culture was ne never important to people before. And now it's getting more important. People are wanting to, to learn more, getting more educated in schools. And my father, well, we were talking to a medium one and, and my father came out through the medium and he was telling me and Bertha, my wife, he was telling us both that what we're doing, teaching people, talking to people, is going to influence people for years and years to come. It's going to help their lives and understanding more, more things. So there is a spiritual, a spiritual, um, pull that's, yes, that's making you feel like you're on the right path. Yes, yeah, there is, yeah. <laughs> Bertha, the two of you working together, oh. that's really special. Tell me what that's like. <laughs> it, it is so amazing um, because, um, of course, with my story of not knowing I was Métis and that I can relate that to people and let them know that you don't have to have grown up in the culture. I mean, it's so wonderful if you can if, and if you do, but uh, talk to your elders, uh, find out things, learn, 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 and, um, and, and then you'll get to a point where you can share. Because I think a lot of times, even as elders, we sometimes are afraid that maybe we don't have enough knowledge to share, but uh, just our, our learned and shared experiences and, and that um, it's all valuable and it all means so much. And uh, to, that's why education is so important to me because when we go into schools, we see the children light up, especially the Métis children. You know, they're like, my mom does this, my dad <laughs> hunting, my, you know, they can relate, they can find something to be proud of. And, um, and, and then the teachers that we find, sometimes they'll even say, you know, I didn't know that about, mm -hmm. about Métis people and, and I'm learning all this. So, um, and you've been doing this for how long? Oh, probably at least eight, nine years. Yeah. yeah. Have you seen a difference? Yes. Yeah, we <laughs> have. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. What is the one takeaway that you hope kids will take away from what you're teaching? I hope people, not even necessarily yeah. kids, but our community yeah. even. Yes. Yeah. I hope I hope children, I hope, you know, teenagers, um, grown ups, everyone, uh, teachers, they can all realize the importance of knowing your culture and the validity of our Metis culture and what a wonderful history we have. And it should never be tossed aside and uh, you know, just buried somewhere or forgotten, like forgotten people we were. Um, it needs to come out and education is, is the definite the route to go. Um, I just hope that people understand where we came from 
and how we got here, and what we can, what we did for the country and helped build the country. Mm. We 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 broke land. We did all sorts of manual labor that created the created the Canada which it is today. And, and just be proud, be proud of your culture. And every culture, you should be proud of no matter what culture you're in. Be proud mm -hmm. and, and let people know who you are, no matter what culture. Bertha and Joe, I just can't tell you how important it is to have your voices. You know, as we move forward in like a fast paced digital world, these stories, these lived experiences are just so important to maintaining the foundation of our culture. And so I brought you a little something that I created for you as a thank you. I just want you to know how important and how heard and seen you are. Oh my gosh. Oh, Lisa, I can see some already. It's beautiful. Oh, Lisa. Yes, oh awesome. my gosh. Can you see? Oh, that is Well, so I just amazing. really felt that this is you. You know, you two in the middle and surrounded by the culture. Oh, thank you so yes. much. We appreciate that. Like other Indigenous peoples of Canada, the Métis people have faced persecution. During the Red River Resistance, Bertha's great-great-grandfather was assaulted just because he was Louis Riel's cousin. This should give us an idea as to why so many Métis families have had to hide who they were in order to fit in. Thankfully, we live in better times. When we come back, we head up to northern BC and we meet someone who celebrates her Métis heritage, printmaker and textile artist Catherine Brudel in Fort St. John. If there's one thing that I learned from my mom and my grandma, it is that they did teach us to take care of each other. Welcome back. Fort St. John is a community that is known for its economic vibrancy and entrepreneurial spirit. However, in the Métis culture, we believe that creative activity has an impact on the social fabric of the communities we live in. You can see it in our beading work, jigging, our fiddle music. Our next guest is from Fort St. John as an artist and a sustainability advocate. Let's meet Catherine Rudell. <laughs> We're in Fort St. John, BC. This is uh, part of the ancestral lands of the Danisaw in Treaty 8 territory, northeastern BC. So this was a project that I started um, when, you know, news of all of the unmarked graves at uh, residential schools started coming out. You know, art is also a way to work through those big feelings and channel those big feelings. And so I carved a new block um, with Every Child Matters. Um, and so I started uh, just making patches and printing them uh, for donations. My Métis heritage is through my mom and my grandma and that side of the family. I have this photo of my grandma. And so she was like uh, the only girl in a family of boys raised on a farm and she just wanted to be uh, a city girl, really. So she's always like pictures of her around the farm, you know, like with her hair done up and and uh, posing. That's how like, I knew my grandma. She loved us so much, yeah. And really, like, if there's one thing that I learned from you know, my mom and my grandma, it is that they did teach us to take care of each other. Um, and that is so strong in my family, yeah. As an artist, a few years ago, um, I developed a body of work for a show. Some of the pieces were exhibited in Prince George and in Fort St. John, um, and it was inspired by my grandma. This is based off of uh, 
a photo of her and essentially um, the series was called To Gather to Harvest and you know her family they were farmers her dad was a homesteader and you know I always heard stories of my great grandma uh, cooking and uh, just taking care of everybody when they're working really hard um, and then one of the main things that I would do with my grandma um, she would take us and my cousins out like berry picking and so we've got like the wheat for farming and the berries um, for gathering. I've really come to see my own creativity so now I really view my education as something that you know is also setting me up for perhaps the next stage of my artistic journey which also makes sense because you know communicating is about storytelling. <laughs> here in the Passive House uh, for just under two years as a caretaker. Passive House is a low energy building, so it uses very little energy to heat and operate. And my partner and I, we offered to be the caretakers or the guinea pigs um, because in order to track how much energy the house used as um, a case study, they needed someone to live in it. I did my own artist in residency here in this house um, and the project was actually this quilt. And the topic of the quilt, you know, once I get started and, and got going, um, that is also, you know, connected to um, energy conservation and the environment, it included a reference to my Métis history. So part of that was digging deeper into uh, my Métis genealogy uh, family stories and our connection to this place and the land, which includes the Peace River. Catherine is a vibrant member of the Fort St. John Métis community and we wish her all the best for her journey. Incidentally, the passive house you saw in this story has been bought from the city by Métis Nation BC and our Fort St. John office will be moving there in the near future. We'll be right back. I actually have an ancestor, Louis de Assiniboine Patnode, who crossed the mountains as a Métis guide. Welcome back. We're in beautiful Kimberley, British Columbia at the Kimberley Alpine Resort. I'm here with Alex Ibbotson and we're here today in this beautiful location in front of the Rocky Mountains. I'd love to be able to present this to you, Alex. It's a uh, sash and it's Thank being presented much. to you on behalf of Métis TV and Métis Nation, British Columbia. Beautiful. Thanks for that gift. Thank you. And I'd also like to present you with a gift. Here's a blanket and the four sacred medicines. Thank you so much for that. And it's a beautiful blanket and it is a little bit nippy today, so I'm sure it will be put uh, to good use. The Rocky Mountains are often seen as a barrier. People don't think that there are Métis people that actually crossed those Rocky Mountains and actually made their way throughout the province of British Columbia. Did Métis people actually like come over the mountains? Were they on this side? Clearly they were, but is there anything, a little bit of history you can tell us about this particular valley and, and the connection to Métis people? I actually have a ancestor, Louis de Assiniboine Patnode, who crossed the mountains as a Métis guide and he guided explorers through one of the Northwest Passages. And it's actually depicted in the Northwest Passage by land. So he, he did that pre-Confederation. So that was in 1865 that he brought uh, Vescott and Chattel across um, the Rocky Mountains. Wow. And, and there's so many geographic places here too that have a connection to, to Métis people. So how many citizens are in this particular region um, that, that you guys work with in your charter community that you guys are aware of? Our charter community has right around 600 wow. uh, registered citizens. And then, uh, you know, based on 2016 census, we're upwards towards about 1,000 self-identifying. 
Yeah, and the Kootenai River watershed is significant because we know that our Métis ancestors traveled by waterway. And then of course the Columbia River is just, just up the Rocky Mountain Trench for us here. Yeah. So the Canal Flats was an area where people um, hopped over from the Columbia River to the Kootenai River. And then you just look at the wilderness here and it was rich with fur. So our more adventurous, extreme <laughs> ancestors were willing to go into the unknown and get um, the abundance of furs. So how many uh, chartered communities are in this area, in this particular region? We're in what's called Region 4 here in British Columbia. Tell me a little bit about the communities that make up uh, this region. So uh, here we like to call it the Kootenai region because we're so um, proud of our Kootenai culture. Um, being out here, whether you're Métis, non-Métis, First Nations, we're all very grateful to be living on the traditional Tanaka territory. And specifically here in Kimberley, we're on the Occam territory. And um, we have six communities within Métis Nation BC charter communities mm -hmm. throughout the Kootenays. We have two in the, south, in the west and south Kootenays, and then four in the east Kootenays. Yeah, I, I heard you guys did something really innovative, which is, which is interesting. You applied for some funding for, from Métis Nation BC, and you got together um, as a region um, for the first time and actually spent, I believe, three days doing a strategic planning process. What happened as a result of that? Actually, that was very generous of Métis Nation BC to have the regional initiatives funding. Mm -hmm. And uh, our communities got together and really just talked about the priorities for us as the Kootenai region, what's important to us. Sometimes when we're out in the sticks here, living in the forest, we get a little disconnected from the hub and, and, and the central locations of Métis Nation of BC. Mm -hmm. So we thought it was really important to get organized ourselves so that we could go to Métis Nation of BC and say these are the priorities that we have. And was there anything that you left with and you went, I wasn't anticipating that? Well, first of all, we were able to bring some um, some things into dialogue that really needed to come out and it, it really connected us as a group and created a sense of belonging with our leadership mm -hmm. and that sense of belonging we really want to share with the rest of the Métis people mm -hmm. so that we can have people come out and feel that it's a safe place and celebrating our Métis culture together. Mm -hmm. And we also, uh, we're all very passionate about children, women, and families. So every initiative that we have, we want to have children, women, and families at the forefront, in the center. And we're doing um, all of our initiatives with the intent of lifting up our vulnerable populations as well and connecting our whole community. Of course, uh, you know, COVID impacted your community like it did so many other Métis communities across British Columbia. What were some of the biggest impacts that you saw and what did you do as a, the local charter community to assist uh, Métis citizens to cope with COVID? Amy Cross, one of our board members, organized a virtual Michif workshop mm. and that was attended by 80 people per session. We had six sessions mm -hmm. and still People are coming out of the woodwork saying that they learned their machif mm -hmm. and that they're so grateful for Amy putting that on. Actually, Amy has also organized a cultural uh, machif camp this oh, wow. weekend that I'll be attending. To, uh, two of our board members will be attending and then also our community navigator and her mother. So we're really, really looking forward to um, learning more and bringing it back to our communities. Well, when you're looking back on the valley here, you see how, how large this region is, how, how challenging it is for Métis people to actually stay connected. And in particular, around when there's th something like COVID, there's, there's additional challenges. But do, do you feel coming out of this COVID and as we kind of move beyond the pandemic, that uh, the community is going to be tighter or closer? How, w w what's your perspective on that? Well, right out of the gates, we phoned all of our citizens to see how they're doing. We had a, co a community navigator employed at that time who was just great at connecting with the um, the citizens on a case-by-case -case basis. So we phoned every single person to see what their needs were. Yeah. And then uh, people who needed things, we stayed in touch. We were a little disrupted because we had some staff turnover, um, but we're, we're getting back our capacity built up again and we're getting ramped up to do the same thing, have a second wave of checking in on everyone, making sure everyone's individual needs are taken care of. And then we're hoping to get more strategic with our programming. Mm -hmm. That was another big part of having the strategic planning event. Right. So then we can go to the people and start figuring out exactly what our citizens need. 
Alex, I want to thank you so much for your generosity for uh, bringing me up to one of the most beautiful places I've seen in a long time. So thank you so much, Alex, for uh, sharing your stories with me. Thank you for coming to visit us. We'll be right back. We came a little later, we took the train. It was quite an adventure because I can, I was, well, I was only five, but uh, I, I still remember it, you know. Like. The Métis stories that we tell on this show have universal relevance, those of overcoming adversity and struggle. In this segment, I want to share with you the life journey of Steve Fayant, owner of Kootenai Comfort Insulation. His father, Winston, moved to the Kootenays in the 1940s and encouraged his children to appreciate their Métis roots. Let's meet Steve and Winston. <laughs> What else do you find in here? Oh, he also put his, uh, see, he put a charger and stuff in the bottom of it. Yeah. No. You see all these old taps here. Yeah. And you know what you never see anymore? Yeah, the pump bobs, yeah. I know, you never see a nice one anymore. What do you use? Laser. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's lasers now. Yeah, well, we had to do everything the hard way. Well, sometimes it's the best way. Something I was interested in, and, uh, I went in construction for a while, and then I ended up in Prince Rupert. <laughs> and I, f I uh, finished my apprenticeship there as a pipe fitter. So, so I started in 69, I think. And I finished in 1971, 72, somewhere around there. Long time ago. <laughs> well, and then we use this one here. Originally, I wanted to be, what was it, a forester. And I was going to school to become a forester, but being young and dumb, I kind of spent all my money and needed a job. And my dad introduced me into the, uh, another person, my old boss, Tony, and I started doing this and I discovered that I absolutely loved it. Perfect. And there's a nice saddle for some insulation on a pipe. In the old days, we used to, when you drop your tools into a tank, whatever equipment, you could never get it back. So we used to have a piece of pipe on here, screwed on here, a long length of pipe, yep. and just go down there and search for this thing. Of course, and you find it, and we'll pull it out. It saved a lot of tools, because uh, uh, not that we were clumsy, just that we had to work in bad, tough spots, you know. Yep. See how we used to mark our tools here. You guys are coming borrow your tools, but they never bring them back. So, so we start marking, we start welding on there with our initials. In, uh, in 1948, there was very, very little work in Saskatchewan. You know, uh, everything slowed right down. You know, like my dad was logging up north and then he had a trap line there for a bit. And he went ahead to, to the trail here. And we came back, we came a little later. We took the train. And uh, it was quite an adventure because I could, I was, well, I was only five, but uh, uh, I, I still remember it, you know, like, uh, going through Nelson, coming to Castle Guard, and then into, into trail at that time. He was, uh, he was a type of person that, uh, uh, he didn't hesitate. You know, like, uh, if we asked him, you know, like, when you go, sometime this, the coming couple of days, when you go and cut the grass, well, he said, no, no, I'll go cut it right now. That's the way he was, he went, he would do it right away, you know. And, you can see he always had this ambition eh, to, to, uh, to do something. I don't know, it's just the way a person always should be. You know, any of your elders ever ask you what to, you to do something for you, just go and do it. It basically goes that he would install piping and I would come after him as an insulator and we'd insulate it all, we'd cover it all up. So we'd uh, apply some insulation and some metal over top of it and make it look pretty and shiny. Cover up all our errors, we fitters me. <laughs> there was, uh, I think there were seven families came in from the Red River that settled in the, in the Batoche area uh, many, many, many years ago. And uh, our family was one of them. Yeah, there's a, so he's, he'd be your great, great grandfather. He died fighting with a, uh, with a Louis Riel. He, uh, he didn't die right away. He, he was wounded, but he got back into Batoche and he died on the stairs of uh, his uncle's place there. 
the Battle of Batasha was fought right on, our, on, our, uh, on the farm. <laughs> yep. Used to have the, there were still a few markings there, you know, the uh, pits where they where used to shoot from. Uh, and then uh, my mother's uncle was the, where the main battle was. That was the next, far, the next ranch over, next farm over. Grand, it's his grandmother, yep. grandfather. This is him. That's me, of course. And uh, he wouldn't know these ones here because uh, uh, there'd be. Uh, yeah, 1865, there. 1855, whatever, whenever they were born. Yeah. No, my mother was Italian. My dad had a French last name. We were Italian and French. And that was it. We never knew anything else. No. And that's just the way it was. You don't even think twice of it because you're just a kid and that's uh, the way you're grown up. So it was something I learned about when I got older. I think the biggest problem there was, was, the, was the parents, like my, the, his grandparents didn't talk about it. You know, they, they uh, uh, when I talked to my aunt uh, in Saskatchewan, she, like, she was 102, she didn't want to talk about it. It was just, uh, it was such a hard time, you know, that. Uh, uh, it was a day-to-day -day survival at that time, and uh, uh, the uh, so they didn't want to talk about it, so they didn't. They didn't. So, and uh, when, when people don't talk about it, you don't hear about it. Well, this this is just part of the part of the cover here. Uh, but that is our sash cover. The there of my people. There's uh, different uh, <coughs> Métis, uh, different different areas have their own sash. They weave their own. This is the one we used, of course. Yeah, yeah I love this area here. It, uh, I, uh, I was uh, seven years up in Prince Rupert, but I, uh, uh, even though I, I live in Castlegar now, but everybody says, well, where's home? And I say, Trail. I live in Castlegar, but Trail's really my home. You know, I know all the people here. I, uh, I, I walk down the street and, uh, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk to every second person. Um, Drives my wife nuts, but uh, <laughs> I'm Winston Fant, and I'm very proud to be Métis. Both Steve and Winston are proud Métis citizens and exemplify what hard work and dedication can do. Speaking of which, when we come back after a short break, we head to Salmo to meet Jody, Métis entrepreneur and Indigenous advocate. My great grandparents are both Métis from the Red River settlement in Manitoba. Welcome back. This episode was all things Kootenai. Next, I want to share the story of Jody Bremner who discovered she was Métis late in life and used that knowledge to help children in Alberta as a kinship care worker. She now lives in Salmo, running an outdoor consignment store, where the Métis V team caught up with her. Salmo is called the hub of the Kootenays, and that means that it is like this town within 30 minutes of each of the bigger centres. So, Nelson, Trail, and Castlegar are all 30 minutes away. This was a consignment sports store, and um, so my husband would bring stuff in to consign, and uh, he said, we should buy it. <laughs> so I was like, well, you know, it might be fun to do something different. Have stuff. Oh, for Alex? Yeah. Yeah, um, leave it on his bed. yeah sure. I, I originally came here because I'm a strong believer in recycling, and this was a great place for me to recycle stuff. And also, it's a local business, and I like the people who are here. Jody and her husband and her daughter are very artistic. They do all sorts of things. I'm sure she's told you about her printing on the shirts. The dirt there. Eight months into buying the store, I started doing some 
of this stuff, my shirts. My first one was a bear, and that one has been popular since then. So this is one of my designs that I just came up with. Um, so I made some kids ones, they're hanging up over there, and people really liked this one So for adults, so I made some for adults. And then this one is a newer one that is pretty popular. So yeah, some of my new designs. My dad's side of the family is Métis, and he wasn't around, he lived on the island. So I grew up as a child of a single parent. My dad's family was all around though, so we, knew, we grew up with them. My great-grandparents are both Métis from the Red River settlement in Manitoba. My grandpa, I don't remember him ever talking about being indigenous at all. I do remember hearing things that were negative that had been said to him when he was younger, so I think that that's probably why he didn't want to. This is my dad's great-grandpa. He was 95 in this picture. He came to the what was now known as the St. Louis District in 1861, shortly before the Riel Rebellion. Knowing, I think that it has a huge impact on your mental health. Of course, that affects you as a person. That affects you, you know, you don't know who you are. You don't know where you come from. Did you get extra work done? Are I, you really behind? Well, yeah, I'm pretty behind. Nice. <laughs> but he gave me the form for volleyball. So I, because... I've always tried to so. tell both of my kids about their, that part of their history. So she's in grade nine, and they haven't really learned a lot in school yet about um, Métis history. Oh, yeah, they teach us the same thing each year. I was just talking to my friend today about like, I'm about to do this for being Métis. She didn't know what Métis meant at all. And I was like, oh, I wish we actually learned what all these different things are in school. We could go more into it, and into like actual culture and everything. I'm sure we're going to be hearing a lot more about Jody's daughter in the future. So before we say goodbye, it's time for you to meet more members of the MNBC team. Over to you, Callum. Thanks, Daniel. We're here at MNBC HQ. Let's go meet some of the staff. What do you, what do you call a mom who is short? Me? A minimum. <laughs> What's your name? What do you do here? My name's Trisha, and I'm the administrative assistant for the Ministry of Health and Mental Health. Okay, and what about your job motivates you? A lot of it has to do with the mental health side of things. Right now we have the uh, Métis Counseling Connect program, which is where we are funding up to 10 counseling sessions for our members. Uh, so that's really cool just to be able to help people. And any big projects uh, for 2022 coming up? It's a secret. Ooh, it's a secret, okay. Well, how about a joke then? What do you call a made up color? A pigment of your imagination. <laughs> <laughs> what does a typical day at work look like for you? A lot of emails and speaking to our community members and helping them out with uh, getting them connected with a counselor or a clinician for their mental health. What's a work accomplishment you're proud of? Uh, I have to say the time that I got to COVID test John Cena. Very nice. Could you see him? You can't see me. My time is now. <laughs> no. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's all for this episode. We'll see you next time. And this wraps the show. Thank you, Kimberly Alpine Resort, for allowing us to film on the ski hill. Remember, if you want to nominate a Métis person to be featured on this show, get in touch. Also, please note the times and stations Métis airs across Canada. You can also watch previous episodes on our website. Thank you for encouraging feedback. I'll see you next time. And until then, Mina Kawapamitten.